Hi everyone, welcome to the Blue Cup podcast. This is the Red, White and Blue show. I'm joined today by Connor and Jack. How are you guys doing? Doing all right? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Yeah. You're good. Uh, before we get started with the podcast, once again, we're trying to hit a thousand subscribers by New Year's Day. So if you know anyone who'd enjoy watching or listening to this, this show or any of the other shows on the Blue podcast, please do share it. And make sure, as we always say, check out our new and improved merch. It's uh, It's been out for a couple months now, so uh, make sure you go and have a look at it. Uh, this week, we're um, we're doing a bit of NFL and NBA. We've uh, we've been on M- NFL focusing the last few weeks. But we've got a few NBA stories chucking around to do at the end of the podcast. We're going to start with the NFL this week, and I'm going to kick us off with um, possibly the second most anticipated young rookie QB to start a game after Trevor Lawrence, who we'll come on to later. Justin Fields having a horror start with the... Uh, the um, Bears versus the Bengals, uh, not yeah, no uh, Browns. Close. <laughs> too many, too many B words. Yeah, Justin Fields. I think he um, he was sacked nine times. Had pretty much no protection from his own line. At one point, there was a good video going round of uh, Jason Peters trying to block uh, Miles My- Garrett with the stop, drop, and roll technique. Literally falling at his feet and trying to roll into him. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to uh, send it over to Connor and see what he thinks. But is this just a blip in the road for Justin Fields, or is this going to be a, a proper problem if he's going to be the starter for the rest of the season? No, I'm going to call this Burrow syndrome. We saw oh, this really? happen last year with the Bengals, I think, where that Bengals O-line could not give Burrow the proper protection pretty much the entire season. And unfortunately, it led to Burrow getting a season-ending injury. And, you know... With this happening, I'm afraid for Fields because he's even smaller than than Burrow is, and unless he's going to be, he's super tough and is going to be able to take the hits. It might be where the O line is so bad that he takes a hit and it ends up injuring him and taking him out like Tua did. I mean, we saw mm-hmm. Tua, Tua is now on the injured reserve, so he's out for at least the next three weeks. Yeah. So you know, it's worrying if I'm a yeah. Bears fan, your O line being this bad. It's especially worrying in week three because it's not like there's not much opportunity going forward for them to change the O-line. So either they're going to have to change somehow their scheme or plays in their playbook so that he's as protected as they're going to be, or they're going to have to start scheming uh, as a key, as for him as a QB, sort of quick passes, more handoffs, which as a which is completely opposite to what Justin Fields is meant to bring to a team, he's meant to be sort of the Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson type, running around the pocket, making big plays, having that time in the pocket to be a bit exciting, to have a bit of this, that and there. But if they're just going to force him with a lack of O-line to be a sit back in the pocket, stir it before you have even the chance to get sacked, it's sort of a, a waste of Justin Fields as a whole. They could have drafted someone else as a whole load of other QBs that can sit there and do that exact same job. Yeah, and I mean, I get it. It's the Browns. It's a good team. So, you know. You're going up against someone like Miles Garrett. They're going to cause trouble either way, and it's a good it's a good Browns defense that they played. Mm-hmm. But nine times is just really bad. We'll see how they bounce back. I think this week, this next week coming up is a good week for him to kind of hopefully bounce back and see if it was just a fluke game, if it was actually the O lines that bad because they're going up against Detroit. Yeah, Detroit's yeah. one of those teams that nobody sees doing much. They've done a lot of looking like they're going to win games and then not winning. So I think this is a good test to see if the O-line is truly that bad or if this is just a fluke because you're facing a really good Browns defense led by Miles Garrett. Mm. And, well, I mean, it's um, – yeah, I was just kidding up with it. I mean, when I think – trying to think Lions, D-line, there's no one particularly scary that springs to mind, Not especially not a Miles Garrett, Chandler Jones, Khalil Mack type. So I no, think yeah. this is this is more the game, and I think when we spoke about Justin Fields three two three weeks ago, we were talking about their schedule and uh, bringing him in uh, after a couple of weeks of having Andy Dalton and sort of introducing him slowly. And uh, we were saying once they get to week four and they've got they've got Lions this week, and I think we we were saying they have a couple decent games where he might be able to get his eye and then oh well, he's got raiders the following week who could be i mean he's one of the ones you raiders are one of the teams you said might be sort of faking at this thing so it could be another good opportunity for him yeah so, it's, uh, it's, it's it looks like i looked it up the the detroit lions defense is ranked 31st out of 32. yeah, yeah. so, so the, yeah. this is the, the game yeah for fields to make his mark yeah and it's all going to depend on that o-line 
To use a to use a golfing term, he's got a proper mulligan here. He's got yeah. a put, put that one out of your mind. Put that first one. This is your real NFL first start. This is a show everyone what you can do. You shouldn't be as fresh. I mean, I'm sure the although they're thirty first, I'm sure the Lions will get through and put plenty of pressure on him anyway. I mean, they're an NFL team, but I think he's going to have like uh, a much better opportunity. And I think it also relies sort of on the rest of the offense sort of picking up because they've got a few experienced players in the um for the in the in the offense at least a couple second or third year uh players and then some experienced players like alan robinson so i think although justin fields he's a hot shot out of college you should have like a bit of confidence he still needs those senior players to sort of back him up a little bit and sort of uh carry him through because i mean it, having just although he's going to try and put this their their browns game out of his head as much as possible it's still going to be lingering in the back of his mind he's got to he's got to sort of be pulled through i think a little bit yeah definitely i think that having you know having older players helps having some senior players i know that's one thing that i think two has had a good advantage of is he's got you know Devonte parker mike gasecki he's got he's got some big pieces around him that are veterans of the sport they aren't fresh mm. bright-eyed bushy-tailed first years or second years, these are guys who have been in the game for a little bit and know exactly what they're doing and have been in a high level since they got to the NFL. And mm-hmm. I think that's needed on every team. So I think Fields will do better. I don't know how he'll do for sure because, again, that O-line is really, really bad if you were looking at the last game. But, you know, we'll have to see how it turns out for him. I was thinking it's interesting how um, even for Jason Peters, who I believe I am Googling some of he's been a he's been a name in the NFL for a few years now. I'm, he might he may well have been all uh, all pro at some point or at least in the Pro Bowl. So I'm thinking it's funny how having surrounding yourself with with a, such a like a bad performance by the O line can make his can make his performance seem even worse because like he um, it wasn't just the right hand side of the he plays left tackle. It wasn't just the right hand side of the line where they were getting through. Miles Garrett was getting through. Pretty much every a, every letter of the alphabet gap <laughs> in the A gap through the D gap. So he was. It's um. It's a. It's, it's more of a systemic problem with the Bears. The Bears offense O line as a general, rather than just a few bad few players having a bad game. I suppose. Yeah, is what I see it as. No, yeah, uh, I think it's just bad. It's just bad. No yeah. other way to sum it up. It's interesting what you're saying about veteran players because uh, and bringing teams up because that brings me to. The second topic I want to talk about, and it's uh, it's going to be it's quite a good topic for me to talk about as a Bucks fan because we've just signed Sherman on a one-year deal. And what I want to, I think uh, I already mentioned this in our sort of uh, podcast group chat, so I think you'll know what my sort of view on this is. But do you think uh, Sherman coming to the Bucks? Do you think he's going to be right for the Buccaneers system, bring the defense up, or do you think he's just a temporary fix on a one-year deal, patch a hole for a couple games, and then then he's back on the bench? I think it's both. I think he's a temporary fix for the year where he's going to be a good, decent piece for this team for the year. I mean, with Richard Sherman, he's still a solid player. But I think at the end of the year, he'll be replaced by somebody either in the draft or in the free agency because I think he is a great player, but I don't think he'll last with this team more than the year. Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing is, yeah. it's a great reaction to a, a bad loss by the Buccaneers, a team that, you know, is surprising everybody by being as good as they are. We expected the Rams team to be good, but I was not expecting the Rams and the Cardinals to be both going and having the seasons that they're having to start. So I think it's a good reaction to a bad loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can see why it's. I mean, it does somewhat patch a hole. But I think what they're trying, the hole they're trying to patch with Richard Sherman, he's not the right person to do it. What I think of Richard Sherman, he's fantastic. He's one of the best in the NFL, especially over the last ten years or so, in locking down receivers in that first five, ten yards, like short out routes, passing off slants to the linebackers and everything. He's locked down. He doesn't get beat underneath too early. He's good with his feet off the line. But then the only problem is, and I suppose when he was younger, it wasn't such a big problem, maybe on the Seahawks, but in recent years, he started to get beat deep a little bit more, which is what, and that's where I think the problem is, because I don't think on the Buccaneers, we have a problem underneath. I think when we were getting beaten by the Rams, they were hitting us over the top. Like the, 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 the bit we were good at doing is when they tried to send Tyler Higby into the middle of the, into the middle of the field or sent Deshaun Jackson on a, 
on a short uh, short slant or something. The cornerbacks are passing off sort of three or two of the best linebackers in the league and probably one of the best linebacker calls in Devin White, Levante David and Joe Tryon, who we just signed in the draft who we just drafted so like I don't think the problem what Richard Sherman's going to be great at doing I think is what we were already was a part of being a cornerback being a secondary that we were already doing well I think what we what we're doing less so is when you don't have that linebacker help on the on the routes where it is almost purely a 1v1 or it comes down to uh how can how quick how far past how much separation can I create deep I think that was the issue so I mean I could be completely wrong maybe he just um he created a bad stereotype for himself in 49ers, at the 49ers in getting beat deep. But I think, to be honest, it could be, um, he could be like the wrong the wrong person. And if that does start happening, I don't know what yeah. they do. So they can't just I think keep he brings signing veteran quarterback. experience, though. I think he brings yeah. that veteran experience. And I think he, he has that experience to know when he's going to be beat. I think one big thing that will need to be addressed is your safeties need to learn to help deep. Hmm. Because if you le- if you have that problem where it's like okay our cornerbacks are getting beat deep, it's a great thing to then go okay we'll have one of our safeties constantly be one of those guys that drops back into coverage and looks for that deep ball if it is a pass. Mm. You know it's very a lot of if you know a lot of players are really good at watching film and can sometimes know exactly what play is being called. I think on the snap if a safety sees that it's going to be a pass and it's going to be a deep one. You know, you got to have that help back. And I think that's one thing that's a struggle with. And I think Richard Sherman's big thing that's going to be helped, he's super, super good. One of his best traits, even honestly, I think more than covering the short routes, is jamming wide receivers straight off the line. That little jam within the first five yards, he's super good at getting into their face, getting into them, and really kind of disrupting their route from even being able to start. And I think bringing something like that to a defense that's already pretty good. Yeah, I think the deep ball is a concern. But bringing a guy who can, even if it is a deep route, can stop that deep route from starting till for another two or three seconds because of his ability to jam off the line, I think will only help the team. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, being a Bucks fan, I suppose I probably have, um, I probably looked at it quite closely watching their games and something. But what I, I think about is, I think Richard Sherman, he's definitely being a veteran. He's going to have that ability, that game sense to be able to shout to a safety and when he's in training saying, if I say this, if I shout to you, you've got to trust me. You've got to, this guy is coming deep. You've got to get over the top. But then the only problem I think about is our, um, our, our star safety from last year, young guy, Antoine Winfield Jr. He's a very, he's a very sort of, well, I like to call it, he's like a rabbity safety. He's sort of like that Derwin James Cam Chancellor sort of person. He's like, if I have to cover, I'll cover. But what I really want to do is come down to the line and hit, hit somebody. Hit, yeah. hit somebody. Well, so he's just like his father. About. He's just yeah. like his father. If you look at Antoine Winfield the first, you know, Antoine Winfield Sr., that's exactly how his father played. Yeah. That's, like, and it's, yeah. Not even, it's not even like I'm just being funny about it. Antoine Winfield as a player, he's an ex-cornerback, so it's funny that his son dropped, up, dropped back farther into safety. His father was known for just being someone who – more than anything, just wanted to obliterate people as yeah. hard as he could. So, you know, it's passed on to his son very well, but I can understand where that's a concern. Yeah, so that's what that's the what springs to mind to me. Although Richard Sherman, I think, has the prestige to be able to say to a safety, this is coming deep, you need to listen to me do this. If he's saying that to Antoine Winfield, who's one of our he's he, he knows he's got the ability to come down to the line, he's like, Oh, I, I'm sure he's got it. I don't it's it's what what's the chances the QB reads it perfectly and sends over the top of Richard Sherman? And that's the sort of horror situation that comes into my mind is that um that he's too he's too focused on being basically a fourth linebacker that he's not gonna can like take on Richard Sherman's advice and cover the deep ball. But we just have to see how I mean. But I mean, they've got a, got a good coaching staff at the Buccaneers. They've shown they can they can build a good defense. So I think they probably will gel over the first few weeks, but I think that's one of the main teething issues I sort of foresee, I think, personally. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Oh. Yeah, go on. It's funny because if you it's funny because he definitely looks to be his father's son and it is kind of worrying if he is his father's son with the Stephens, I think with a little bit better of corners who can guard that deep ball, he could I mean that's what Winfield thrived on is having corners who could guard the deep ball so he could do what he wanted. And, I mean, it worked for him pretty well. The amount of, you know, you look at his career stats just into 
Winf- Antoine Winfield Sr. only had 27 picks over 14 years. So, I mean, it's about two interceptions a year with about 1,000 tackles over the course of his 14 years. So, I mean, that definitely looks to me as someone who is more focused on the tackles and more focused on making it once the ball has gone to a player than trying to make sure that that ball does not reach that player in the first place. But I think you know he's young. He's got time. I think this year, you know, it's the Buccaneers. They're a good team. It's not like you need to be too worried. You have Brady. <laughs> yeah, we can't we can't put Brady on the deep ball. I suppose yeah. we could try. I mean, he's the sort of bloke he'd be like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go, and then within a couple of seasons, he can he can do it pretty well. Yeah, he probably. He'll be a he'll be a <laughs> number, he'll be a top three cornerback in about the next three years if he just tries. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Every team will be like, "No, your arm's not strong enough. You're not playing uh, quarterback anymore." He's like, "Fine, I'll go on defense." Yeah. If I can. <laughs> um, well, I mentioned it earlier. I sort of set us up um, for this when I talked about the most, the second most easy, and to talk about Justin Fields starting at rookie QB. I think we have to talk about when we were all doing the preseason shows. We were talking. We were quite excited to see the Jaguars. Maybe they'll be a bit of an underdog, a bit of a dark horse team this year. And they've, uh, especially with Trevor Lawrence, number one draft pick, one of the most anticipated coming out of college, and they've come out four straight losses. And what I want to, and what I want to talk about is, is it, is this going to continue the rest of the season, or are they actually showing a bit of promise? It's just getting shrouded in the fact that they keep losing. Because what I'm, I was looking at the stats, and um, Trevor Lawrence is 17 of 24. This is against the Bengals last, or well, for us last night when this goes out, a few days ago. But 17 of 24, 204 yards, no interceptions, no touchdowns. So it's a fight. Like, didn't shy. He didn't do anything dramatically. But it, that's that's got to be half decent passer rating. He's ma- he's making the passes he needs to do, and he's um he's going for a decent amount of yardage. The t- the only reason he didn't throw for touchdowns is because the Jaguars pretty much their motto is power him with a running back on the two yard line. Which but, is happy uh, for me because James Robinson's on my fantasy team, so he got yeah, me a healthy so, amount of he got me a healthy yeah. amount of points to start the year. Yeah, start my week. Seven, seventy-eight yards, two touchdowns. So, uh, so yeah, decent. Nice so what, uh, yeah, so what I'm thinking is, is it's actually as bad? Like, is it? Is not actually Trevor Lawrence being underwhelming? Well, personally, from my point of view, I want to know what you think. But personally, from my view, I don't think it's actually Trevor Lawrence being underwhelming. I just think it's a Jaguars team that struggled for a couple of years, struggling even more because they brought in a new coach in Urban Meyer who's not ready for the season. And they just, they, although they, they were pretty hyped up going into the season, they're going to continue to struggle until they sort out some systemic problems. But well, I don't know what you think, Connor, about that. Well, first, I've just been informed that we are releasing this on today. This is not coming out a day late like usual. This is coming out <laughs> apparently today, right after we <laughs> finish filming. around. But with the Jaguars, I think, I mean, I don't blame this on Trevor Lawrence. I really don't. He's been very <laughs> solid. as a, If you look over, his year, over the, the stats over the course of the last three weeks, he's been very solid. I mean, like you said, he's, so his, his throwing yards in the, last, in the starting four games, right, 332. 118, 219, and 204. So a bad game against a decent Denver defense. But besides that, they're ranked for over 200 yards each time. They're averaging. I'm going to do a quick, quick averaging here. 20. I can. It's, it's nice because I can just look at the lowest score of each game and know that that's them because they haven't won thing anything. But they're averaging almost 19 points, almost 20 points a game. You know, you'd think at some point. That'd win you a game, right? You'd think at some point, 20 points is going to win you a game. But unfortunately, I think their biggest weakness is their defense is just not good. It's a really bad defense. And it's giving up 37, 32, 31, and 24, especially this last game against a not very good Bengals team where they held the lead for the start. They were up pretty nicely to start the game and then kind of just blew the lead like the Dolphins did. But mm-hmm. I think I think it's just... It's going to be a bad year. It's going to be a really bad year. I remember Peyton Manning's first year in the NFL. He was 3-13 and with the Colts in 1998. I have a feeling yeah. that's going to be fairly similar where this is going to be a really bad team this year. They're going to go out 
and kind of grab some more pieces, especially on that defensive side. Next year, we'll see a lot better of a team. But I think this year is unfortunately going to be uh, a very, a very <laughs> struggling, struggling year for the Jaguars. As I look mm-hmm. at, as I look at you calling out uh, <laughs> <laughs> Josh for not releasing the show. Yeah, if you're wondering, if you're wondering why we skipped a week last week and didn't say anything, uh, didn't. I think Jim, yeah, we did. Yeah. We're all fine. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's interesting what you say about Trevor. It's what the only thing I hope doesn't happen is I hope it's not that he gets trapped. He does a, what I like to call a Barry Sanders, where he's trapped in this Jaguars team that never seems to improve, and we never, although we see shines of brilliance from Trevor Lawrence over the next five, six years, as a, or maybe probably even longer, 10, 12 years, as a, if he stays with the Jaguars that whole time, but just never gets out of the scheme. So, in um, theory, this should never happen again, according to our boss. But yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, but I mean, this could easily be a Darnold situation. It could either be a Barry Sanders situation where he just sticks with one team and it's kind of just not a great great time for that for that player, or this could be a Sam Darnold situation where in two years – you know, Lawrence gets fed up and goes, you know what? I'm tired of this. Trade me. And he goes to a team that's a little bit better, like Darnold has with the Panthers, and Darnold is now thriving under this Panthers offense. Mm-hmm. It's incredible the turnaround he's had in his career. I did not think he was a great, amazing quarterback, but he's proving himself to be a very, very solid quarterback, you know, going into this next, this next game. And this looks like a team that could be one of those teams that actually – you know, surprises everybody. It actually does way better than that anybody thought. Because, I mean, they started off the year with a win against the Jets, a win against the Saints, and now a win against the Texans. And the win against the Texans and the Saints was not close. Mm. And now they go up against the Cow. I think they will have difficulty get them, though. They go up against a team Sunday in the Cowboys that is coming off a very, very good game against their biggest rivals in the Philadelphia Eagles and is a very, very good defensive team with players like Leighton Van Der Egg. And that linebacker core. So I think this will be a good test game for Darnold to really see if the Panthers are pretenders or contenders. There is, a, there is of course, the uh, the Barry Sanders, as you say, the Sam Darnold. There is, of course, the uh, third possibility, which I imagine in Trevor Lawrence is highly unlikely, but I like to call it the Josh Rosen, where he, uh, he uh, has a bit of a terrible time in Jacksonville and just gets passed around every every NFL team over the few red shirting. Which, uh, although I imagine, is highly unlikely for Trevor Lawrence, wouldn't that just be a fantastic story for just such an amazing college and high school career, seventy-four and four, or something, to, to amount to sort of uh, just completely dissipating in the uh, in the NFL? Not that I think it's going to happen, but you've got to you've got to mention it as a possibility, surely. No, I think the player that's most likely to do that, and funny enough, I'm going up against him in my fantasy team this week, is Jalen Hurts. Oh yeah, no, he's gonna be. Good. It's gonna be. A, it's gonna be a long career of pain for him, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, then um, I don't know if you uh, if you watched the highlights against the Cowboys, but the commentators kept saying it. And by because uh, with his interceptions and drop passes and things, they by the end of the game, the commentators were actually getting sort of angry at Jalen Hurts when they were calling the game because they were like, "He's underthrown the ball again. This he just doesn't drive through the ball. He tries to." Um, he, he tries to sort of drop it into the receiver as if they were on the run. Even if they're not on the run, every, everyone is sort of like throw it up in the air. It's perfectly gracefully coming down into a cor- in a cornerback hand. He's a pretty boy trying to make everything look pretty, and he has to every- make yeah. everything. Like, sometimes you just need to get the ball to the player, and he likes to just yeah. make it look good. It's like, no, football is not supposed to be a sport where you have to make it look good every single time, you know? Yeah. Power backs are a perfect example of not making it look beautiful every single time you get the ball. Their yeah. job is I'm going to grab the ball and I'm going to run through you, and you're going to deal with it. If you can take me down, good luck. But most of the time, I'm going to run you. I mean, you look at if you want to talk about a great power back, for me, the first one that springs to my mind is uh, Jerome Bettis. Yeah, okay. Old, I thought, I think, old, uh, old Steelers uh, running back. I, I, had the, I had very similar. I had Eddie George. Yeah, just a big. I mean, he's the bus. Yeah, it was yeah, not. Yeah. It wasn't pretty. He wasn't some dude who wanted to make every single time he got the ball look pretty, but just ran through people, made a career mm-hmm. out of it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very. But um, I mean, yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to see. Um, I think we we want to get some NBA in this show as well, so we're going to finish off the NFL section with uh, how we've been doing the last few weeks, talking about um. 
what games we're looking forward to this week. And I want to sort of I want to open up just because I think there is, in my eyes, only really one choice. It's probably it's two teams. If people have said who do you think to be three and zero would be three and zero, and I think it's the Cardinals Rams. Both teams going into the season, I knew in the back of my mind they were good teams. I could think like, oh, they on paper they look like good teams, but I didn't have them being quite as dominant as they've been. I think it's going to be a good matchup. It's a, it's a, it's a Kyler Murray who's coming into his own versus a Matt Stafford who's rejuvenated in an actually solid offense. So um, I, I'm really looking forward to it. I'll definitely be watching it. Sunday, Sunday night game for us, I guess that's Sunday afternoon. Sunday, so like, yeah, very early <laughs> afternoon for me. Yeah, that's one. That's yeah. a one o'clock game for me. I'm like, I'm chilling in the afternoon. I'm gonna be yeah. awake for that. Yeah. I got a busy Saturday. It's gonna be a long day. Um, <laughs> but, um, but that, yeah, it's, um, I think I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And I'd like to, I'd like to see what both teams. And I, I think, um, I think to be honest, if either whichever team wins, I'm gonna be surprised. I, I think if uh, someone was to ask me, who do you think's got the upper hand? I, I couldn't call it. I just, I'm excited. I'm, if even even though the Buccaneers are playing, I'm more excited to see two other teams playing, especially one who beat us last week. Yeah, um, I don't know how excited I am to watch my team get beat again. So I'm probably <laughs> right. I think I'm right with you there. We're playing the Colts, which should be a team we beat because it's Brissett going up against his former team, and it's a team we should be beating because I think we're a better team than the Colts. They're 0 and 3, <laughs> but it's the Dolphins. So never count. The Dolphins out when it comes to finding a way to lose. I mean, look at the game against the Raiders this last week, mm-hmm. winning fourteen to two after the first quarter, and we lost. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, talking about coming up against the Colts, is Carson Wentz still healthy? I feel like at this point, if Carson Wentz get injured, it wouldn't even make the news. It would just be like, oh, Carson Wentz doing Carson Wentz. Doing. Yeah, it's like it's like McCaffrey. Can he stay healthy for more than two games? I don't know. Yeah, will 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 he? He's uh, he's got a permanent. They might as well uh, not have a questionable on fantasy next to McCaffrey and uh, Wentz's name every time. Everyone just knows they're questionable. Yeah, they're gonna like expect them to be. Ooh, Lamar Jackson's just gone questionable. He was questionable last week, so I didn't. But last week was because he had a tummy bug. No, this is his back. Uh, he's just been sidelined. Uh, side. He hasn't played today. He hasn't practiced today for the Ravens. All right. Lots of people are questionable that are not people I want to be questionable because they're players that play for me. <laughs> exactly. Especially well, because my backup quarterback is on the injured reserve because <laughs> it's Tua. What? How, how have you, oh, right. You just you refuse to let him go. Yeah, I haven't let him go because I don't want to miss out on the fact that I, I, I have a bad feeling I wouldn't be able to get him back. Yeah, no, certainly. I'm sure he'd get taken. <laughs> So I'm like, I don't want to let him go, but I don't have a spot in the IR because I have Michael Thomas, yeah, who I also don't want to like get snapped up because when he comes back, he's you know he's Michael Thomas, he's going to be a beast for the Saints. Yeah. So I'm really hoping Lamar Jackson's not out for this game, especially because it's Denver. He can absolutely take Denver behind the woodshed and take him for about 50 points. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to see. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I think we've uh, we've done a lot of uh, previewing of NFL. So we've got a lot to be excited for, and um, as a little preview for next week, uh, we've left out probably the top, the biggest story of the week, which was uh, Justin Tucker's sixty-six yard game winner. The reason we have is because uh, I'd quite like to set it up for next week. I'd quite like a Justin Tucker Adam Vinatieri debate. I'm not going to reveal too much, but we've already mentioned it in our group chat. So I want I want certain people to be here, so we uh, we have someone on each side. I thought you were going to say you were um, going to get him on as a guest or something. I was like, wait, what? Well, yeah, if we, if we have to. I mean, if the oh, yeah, people yeah. aren't available, we'll just go and get them both ourselves. But yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll bring it up next week. But for the moment, we've, um, we, haven't, we haven't had the NBA on for a few weeks now. So we're gonna, I'm going to pass over to Jack and Connor, who's going to talk about a few of the stories that have been bouncing around the NBA over the last week or so. All right. Uh, welcome to the NBA section of this podcast. Uh, so we're going to go through um, the Kings and the Maps preseason games, and we're going to have a little brief discussion about um, uh, media day, maybe, and uh, the um, unvaccinated players and the beef around Ben Simmons. Um, so let's start this off with the uh, Kings preseason Connor, how are you feeling? Uh, ready for four L's. Just 
so ready to embrace the hurt that is being a Kings fan. Starting off our starting off our year against the Suns, the Clippers, the Trailblazers, and the Kings. Joe, if I put it in NFL terms, we're pretty much starting off against the Patriots, the Trailblazers, not the the Buccaneers. Yeah, that would be yeah. But we're basically starting our year our preseason with the Patriots, the Buccaneers, the Rams, and the Cardinals. Basically, yeah. in NBA in NFL terms, our first four games of the preseason. Hmm. It's not a good oh, year. It's not a good at start. Least any, so at least any preseason. Yeah. Well, if I look at this, you have the Suns who made it to the finals last year. You have the Lakers, which have a big, big lineup. LeBron, Russell Westbrook, <laughs> um, Anthony Davis. They, uh, and then you have Clippers. They're just defensive. Uh, they still have real good players on there. And the Blazers, which might be uh, the Clippers and Blazers are your possible wins, I'd say. If we can get wins, it's going to be those two games because this is four teams that all made the playoffs last year. Yeah. Well, your first game uh, for the actual season is Blazers. How do you feel about that as well? Um, I'd feel better about it if we had some players on the team not here. And speak, I'll, I'll speak more on that media day-wise when we talk about media day, how I feel about that. Okay, yeah. But I, have, I, I would feel better if a couple players weren't on the team and a couple players were on the team. And again, one of those players that I wish was on the team will also speak about in a little bit because he's been in the headlines recently for not so great things. But I think it's a team that it could go either way, but I only see us losing. I, I, I just have a feeling we'll lose our first game. Yeah. Well, I'm right there with you. I have a not as bad of a of a lineup of uh, preseason games, but uh, starting off our, our preseason with Jazz, Utah Jazz. Uh, that's definitely going to be an interesting game. I know they're uh, they're definitely up there for for coming third seed this this year. I think I, I've seen third seed quite a lot. Um, we also have Clippers, the current champ, uh, champions, uh, Bucks, and Hornets. I'm thinking Clippers and Hornets could be a win. Yeah, Hornets are a decent team with Lamelo, but I don't think it's a team that's going to be anywhere troubled by a team that's got Doncic, Porzingis, Finney Smith, stuff like that. I just think that team's too, the Mavs team is too good to lose a game like that. Yeah, and then our first game uh, of the actual season is Hawks. Uh, they have Trey Young and quite a few other um, players which they're trying to build around him. Uh, that might be a close one. Uh, what do you think would happen in that game? I think it's just, I think that's a team, I think that's a game where it's going to be what star can take over the most. <clears throat> that yeah. can easily be a team, that can easily be a game that goes either way. Either you could see Trey Young going off for 40 and the Hawks winning, or you could see Doncic going off for 30 with, you know, 10 assists and eight boards and end up winning by 20. It's just two very solid teams that it really could go either way. I can't really pick one right now looking at the teams. Yeah, I'm entirely there with you. Right. Uh, I think you're fine after that. Raptors, Rockets, Spurs. I think you're you're going three in a row right after that. But start of the year, it's it's shaky. Yeah. So uh, this topic can kind of go into a uh, NFL as well. Uh, unvaccinated players. What is everyone's take on that? <laughs> I mean, for me, I get it. I get not feeling the vaccine because I don't feel the vaccine. And, you know, a lot of people around the world are very, very still nervous about it. And it's something where there's a lot of still, you know, for all the va people that have gotten vaccinated, there's still that concern about a lot of things to do with the vaccine. But if it is a widespread, I feel like making it a widespread rule kind of I feel is a little ridiculous for me because you're kind of taking away someone's personal choice and you've heard from pretty much all of his teammates going I'm not going to force him and or yell at him to get the vaccine I'm not going to force him to go get it yeah. but I you know, understand your point of view but um, 
realistically, these guys are athletes, so their bodies should be able to uh, to make it through whatever vaccine they they're put through, um, and there shouldn't really be many uh, consequent consequences coming from it. But yeah, I understand kind of like the the free power kind of thing, you know. You know, like I get, I get what they're trying to do, and I don't disagree with them. I think it's the best choice for them to go with. Hey, everybody needs to be vaccinated because we want to keep everybody safe and healthy, and we won't, don't want any COVID outbreaks. I get that because I don't want to see the NBA season canceled again. So I think it's it's the best idea for them. But I think it's and they're going to be hard pressed to force players to do it if they don't want to, like we've seen with Wiggins. But you know, we'll have to see. I in the end, I think it's it's going to be something where we're going to see everybody vaccinated. And I think that's for the best, but. Time will tell. Yeah, I think it's going to be. It's going to be. I mean, I don't know of any um, in the NFL so far. I mean, I haven't seen any stories. I don't know if Connor, you have, but I think it's too difficult for uh, in for them to force sportsmen to do it. I think um, I'm, I'm going to agree with you in terms of keeping everyone safe. It's probably the best option. But if um, if you're a you're a professional sportsman, you've got you should be sensible enough to to to, to see the risks. And realize if you if you get it, you're going to miss uh, at least a week or so of your own sport. Like you miss the opportunity to stats. You're going to you're missing the opportunity to get game time, especially if you're a player on the fringe, perhaps. And also, you've got to realize that if um, if you happen to take any other players out of the game, of then then how's that affecting your team? So I think it's um, it's like uh, I, I I think they'll probably they'll leave it. So there's a there's a bit of there's there's choice in it for sure. But it's um, yeah. I think the the fact that a lot of the players will under, will be able to see the risks will mean that it doesn't become too much of an issue, to be honest. Because I think they'll know to keep themselves safe for the sake of both their own game time and also their teams. As long as they as long as they're committed to whatever organisation they're playing for, I think they'll they'll understand what they need to do. Really. Yeah. Uh, so one of the main players of, um, who have not been vaccinated and might not be able to play Kyrie. He might not be able to play in this very first uh, preseason game against Lakers. Uh, that's going to have a big impact on the the next start of the season. I know it's preseason, but it's all about mind games at that point. And if they're actually able to uh, to win against the Lakers. I don't think they win against the Lakers without Kyrie. I think this is a, a thing that they really don't need right now. Coming off of a very big, upsetting end of their season with the injuries that they had with KD and stuff like that that ended their playoff run, I think having Kyrie not come back because of the vaccine is something that they they don't need right now. I understand. But I think it's just going to lead to losses for them. It's going to lead to them coming off to a bad start until he is able to come back or until he decides to get the vaccination and come back. Yeah. Uh, so should we move on to Ben Simmons? Yeah, let's go with Ben. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what Connor's been most excited for. Oh, it is <laughs> funny. <laughs> I mean, I'm excited because the the team that's most likely to get him is mine, and we I think with him we become a team that makes the playoffs. But it's a bad situation in Philadelphia and a lot of players are speaking out and a lot of big news is coming out of Philadelphia that does not make the situation look any better than it is, which fair enough. Embiid basically said that we've done everything to make him happy. And apparently that Jimmy Butler trade to, to Miami was influenced by Ben Simmons. And so he's kind of going, we've done everything we, you wanted to get you the ball, make sure you were the main ball handler on this team. And now you're being a baby about it and crying. And a lot of the players, I think the players attempted to try and go fly out to LA to talk to him. And he basically said, don't even come because I'm not going to listen. Yeah. Well, Simmons is a, he feels like the team hasn't been built around him. But Embiid literally said, over the years, our team has been built around Ben Simmons. <laughs> so it's kind of, do you think uh, he just doesn't appreciate what the team's done for him at all? And even if he goes to another team, he won't feel like 
any team has really contributed towards playing around him at all. Yeah, I think he's being a little bit of a baby about it. I think this team's done a lot for him, and he needs to realize how much this team has done to try and keep him happy. It makes me a little bit nervous if he comes to the Kings because he's not going to be the main ball handler for us. Our point guard is De'Aaron Fox. It's going to stay De'Aaron Fox, and he's going to be the one leading the team as he has since he joined. And, you know, if Ben Simmons does not like that and is not ready for that as much as I would love to have him on the team, and I think he takes us over the edge of being into the being a playoff team, he might not be the best fit for us. He might be a better fit for a team that does not have – that set ball handler, that set point guard that's already ready to go to where he can take over that role and be that role because he's not going to be that with the Kings. I think he, we kind of get to a point where uh, all of this kind of having a, a well, he's basically crying over nothing. Um, it's actually pushing away a lot of his options. Lots of uh, teams might actually not really want to uh, have him on their team if he's making such a hassle over all, all of this. Uh, he could end up at uh, Atlanta. Um, do you think he might? I think Atlanta would be hard pressed to go for him because while they're getting a good player, I think it's hard for them to go after him because they have such a good core and such a young core. And they'd have to include at least one piece of that core in it, and I think that's just not worth the risk that comes with Ben Simmons to do that, especially because, like the Kings, he will not be that main ball handler. It's going to be Trey Young, and he's got to be okay yeah. with the fact that he's not going to be the one, the main guy with the ball in the hands when he's coming down the court. I mean, he's a player uh, who thinks he's a top five player, but he's not. He's a uh, he's barely even the best in his team, considering I think Embiid's much better, better fit for that team uh, than Simmons is, and they might they might do better if uh, if they get someone else from that uh, from that trade. Maybe they could trade him off to a uh, somewhere to get a really good player that matches Embiid's uh, offense and defense. Yeah, I mean, it's costing a lot of money for Simmons to sit out. It costs him 7500 for every missed practice he has. And as soon as the actual season starts, he's going to be fined $227,000 every single game he misses. So it's going to be costly. And I think it's a little bit of delusion on the, the 76ers part. The reason that they're trying to be very slow about trading him is not because I don't think it's mostly because there's no trade, because I bet you there are trades there that they would take. I think it's mostly because they think that they can salvage this, and they shouldn't. Yeah. They well, purely just I should not. I think that they kind of want to keep him. Uh, but really, he's just ruining the chemistry between him yeah. and his other players. Uh, if they, uh, He might even become a bench player if, uh, if he makes that much of a big deal over all of these. <laughs> Small, small, petty things. Yeah. Uh, if he wants to be the best uh, kind of player he can, he really needs to like work on his teamwork and stuff. And uh, and he has definitely not started there yet. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's. I think it's a frustrating situation on both sides because I can see why Simmons wants to leave, and I just feel like. I think it's stupid by the 76ers to go, yeah, we're not going to, we're going to take our time trading him because, hey, you know, we think we can solve it. No, you can't. No, you can't. If he's at the point, if he's demanding a trade, yeah, you can salvage it then. But when he's saying, I do not want to be with you so bad that I'm not going to show up for practice, I don't want to play with you, you're not salvaging that. Yeah. It's just, I think the teams, the teams I think he goes to, I think, the three teams I say leading this race are the Cavs, the Pacers, and the Kings. Yeah, I think uh, if he went to the Kings and was uh, unhappy with uh, being there, then he just wouldn't play for you guys. He kind of just sit them out and stuff. And it's a waste because we're going to be sending players the other way. It's not like he's a free agent. He's a guy we're going to have to trade 
our players and picks for. And if he ends up being someone who ends up not liking the situation and being like whining like a little brat and saying, I'm not going to play, then it's a waste. We just wasted and we're now missing players that could be playing for us and draft picks we could have used on players. Yeah. I mean, I reckon MB3 and Buddy Hield, uh they'd go for him and possibly a second round draft pick. Um, probably 2022 20, if you still have that one. Yeah, I just I don't see it happening right now. Well, there was a uh, I think I sent you uh, the other week a possible Mavs uh, Kings trade. I liked that one. I liked that one. Uh, I did not. <laughs> I loved that trade. You hated it. I loved it. I uh, well, that's kind of obvious because uh, you'd lose both the uh, was it Hield and MB three and some uh, picks. Was it? Yeah. Let me see if I can find it because it made me laugh because I loved it and you hated it completely. <laughs> but we would lose uh, Benny Smith, um, uh, Paul Zingas, uh, and I think someone else. I think he makes it Brown. JJ Reddick retiring was also huge. Oh, yeah. I that was also a huge. That. Just throw that in real quick. That's a, that's a Hall of Famer right there retiring. One of the greatest three point shooters. Of this last 10, 20 years, yeah, yeah. retiring. That's a that's a big that's a big player leaving the game, and I wish him the best going away into retirement because he deserves all the best. He's a great guy, great. He's a great locker room guy his entire career. He's a great player his entire career. So, all the best to him in retirement. Yeah, so he averaged twelve point eight points uh, through his nine hundred and forty regular season games. Um, and uh, he's fifth, rank fifteenth uh, for um, for his three point range. Yeah. Uh, so that's quite good. Thirty seven yeah. years old. Um, I think he picked a good time to go though, because it's not like he was someone who is not you know who's still kind of young and still you know has he's 37. yeah that's an age where any sport you get to 37 and unless you're lebron ronaldo brady you're calling it quits well you'd have to at least consider it um there's quite a few 37 year olds uh in the in the nba right now yeah, I think he he's a smart guy as well to the point where I think he's one of those people where he saw that he has made a bunch of money and he's probably been very smart about saving it, not spending it and blowing all that money. He saved it. And he's made a lot of money and he can go, yeah, I can step away and I'll be just fine. We could see him in around the NBA. I could see him going and being in a coaching position or maybe an analyst down the road, but I think this is the best move for him. I do have the trade now. It's Porzingis and Finney Smith for Heald, Bagley, and a second round pick. That's not uh, even yeah. ours. It's the Hawks' second round pick. Uh, that's the. Uh, I think. Uh, I don't think it was even like a real one. I think it was just one which. Uh, it's a hopeful one by probably round. a Kings fan who entered yeah. it in. Yeah. These Kings fans yeah. trying to get rid of all their players, which they didn't. Don't want <laughs> trying to get in some good talent like a uh, uh, Ben Smith. <laughs> That'd be nice. I've uh, I've got an interesting story for you guys. I was just um, having a Google while you guys were chatting between yourselves, and the um, one of the stories coming up over the last few weeks is uh, whether Zion Williamson is going to be ready for the start of the season. I was looking their first. Uh, I don't think we play in preseason. But their first two games are 76ers and then the Bulls on the 21st and 23rd of October. What do you think are the uh, Pelicans' chances this season if they don't have a healthy Zion? Absolute shit. <laughs> yeah, the, even with a healthy Zion, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be so difficult for them. Um, I know for a fact like he could, he could potentially pull them all the way to playoffs, but if he's not, uh, if he's not there... He might as well just pack his bags and try and accept a trade because 
he's not he's not gonna like learn that much there. He needs someone to teach him, like a very physical player. Um, and but uh, I also think like if he went to Mavs as well, the that that would just be such good combination. Oh, of course, he wants him on the Mavericks. I wonder why he oh, wants him on the Mavericks. <laughs> It would be good. <laughs> Can I play on the Mavericks? I wonder why. I think why. everyone does want Zion. Oh, no, I would love Zion. I'd take Zion right now. Yeah. Well, what, what, we're just a, a few days after having foot surgery. You want a Zion right now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd have him. Yeah. yeah, I'd have him right now, even after foot surgery. <laughs> you, might, you, might, you might end up uh, paying paying him a few months to, to sit and, uh, and watch, I suppose. But if he okay. can have him secured. <laughs> Great. Awesome. All right, fine. Yeah, and he'll come yeah. back and he'll absolutely dominate, and we'll be a playoff team. Well, when you uh, so when you uh, trade for a player and it's kind of like mid-season, there is like a cool-down time where that player can't uh, can't play. So oh, right. he's sitting on the bench, and like uh, he'd just be uh, burning that time down a little bit, wouldn't he? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, it's in, it's interesting because uh, he's a, uh, I suppose from someone who doesn't follow the N- N- NBA that closely, Zion Williamson is sort of a, a key word, like a trigger word name you hear and you think, oh, former first overall pick, was he? So uh, you uh, you think he must be dominating by now. He's had a year or two, uh, so it's interesting to see how he's doing with the Pelicans from your guys' point of view. Well, I think uh, he's definitely dominating. Uh, but he just he needs someone by his by his side to uh, kind of lift him up a little bit. Uh, Pelicans don't really have that great of a team. Uh, I think they did they have Lonzo. They, they have Brandon Ingram. He's been pretty oh, solid. Yeah. I think they well, just need one more piece. Okay. I think they're another team that's just one piece away from being a way better team than they are. They and they tried Ingram. it with Steven. They tried it with Steven Adams, but it didn't work. How old is Ingram right now? Though? I think he's like 26. Don't quote me on that. Except, the oh yeah, no, he's 24. He just turned 24. Sorry, sh- I thought he was older. <laughs> I did too. We share we share a birthday month. <laughs> yeah, that's not. I mean, that's not that. I mean, that's one in 12, but. Yeah, it's not like it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they definitely need one more player. When you said that, when you when you started with we share the same, uh, we share a birthday. I was like, oh, if you stop the sentence there, that, that's that's fairly it's only then month. I wish we shared a birthday. <laughs> I, I I don't know anybody cool that shares a birthday with me. There is a website you can do that. Maybe that's I'm actually looking. I'm looking. Episode. I'm looking it up now. Because <laughs> so I'm just that lame, and I'm gonna go look it up. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I think I'm okay now. All right. I'm not mad. <laughs> Who do you have? I'm just uh, surprised by the order they've decided to give it to me. And like, the first like few I haven't heard of at all, and then they start giving. Uh, right, and then you have the ones that you actually recognize. Yeah. Because I have Tom Felton, who who was in Harry Potter, the guy who played Draco Malfoy in Harry Potter. And then I have uh, Joan Jett, who is a really famous old rock singer who I actually have heard of, and I actually rather like their music. And then I actually share a birthday with Tiago Silva, <laughs> which. Really hurts because I hate Chelsea. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I think it's a bit of a. <laughs> I love his song. I love the Tiago Silva song, though. I think that song is very good, though. Probably Martial. <laughs> <laughs> just deteriorated. Yeah. It's like, what do you guys talk about? Who we shared a birthday with? <laughs> 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 we, we, Should that we be the a, title? <laughs> yeah, we, we went on a slight tangent. <laughs> slight tangent, very small. <laughs> I mean, mine's weird. The first, yeah, the first few I haven't heard of. Then I get Stan Lee, John Legend, and Denzel Washington. Oh, very strong. 
Very then I've strong. got then even somehow down at then at twenty three I have Seth Myers and that's what Ooh, I was very, very you have a really solid list. Yeah. But as I say, the first few I haven't heard of at all. Actually, uh, maybe you guys heard of Quackity or Nash Greer. Um, <laughs> Beats me. Oh right. <laughs> YouTube, I, I hate the fact that people are showing up and it's like YouTube star, or a TikTok star. Like, shut up! No, you're not. <laughs> like, no, you're not. You're not a celebrity. Please go away. <laughs> it's like half my list. I hate it. It's literally a mix of like K-pop, YouTube, and TikTok stars, and then the three I said that I actually recognized. Oh, that sounds like. <laughs> it's not good. It's not a good time. That's uh, all I had for NBA. Uh, yeah, that's all I had. you want to add on to that, uh, Connor? That's all I had. I think it's going to be an interesting year. I think the Pelicans are a decent team that just need one more piece, and then they should be there. They're a lot like the Kings, but I think their two pieces are better than the Kings' two pieces, as much as I hate to say. I think Brandon Ingram and Zion are pretty a pretty good double to have, but I think they just need one more person to get over the line. Imagine if uh, like you got both uh, uh, Ingram and Sion. <laughs> You'd actually be a bit unstoppable to be fair. Don't yeah, know that'd be annoying. How you do that trade though. That'd be really annoying. You'd have to trade like your entire team. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Worth it though. <laughs> Unless they get injured. <laughs> yeah, well, if you guys are all done with the uh, NBA, I think we can uh, wrap it up there i'm sure we've got a lot of good stuff nfl and nfl to look forward to this week and then nba as we start building up towards the season uh towards the end of this month uh thank you everyone uh for watching we really we hope you enjoyed uh the episode as much as we we've enjoyed making it if you uh make sure to come back next week we'll be finding out who uh josh and billy share a birthday with um <laughs> Um, if you are new to the channel, please do hit the uh, subscribe button and uh, like the video if you enjoyed it. If it really does help us out, uh, and we like uh, we like seeing that everyone's uh, watching and enjoying our videos. Uh, don't forget, as we mentioned at the beginning, we um, check out the merch, new and improved. And uh, oh, otherwise, yeah. oh, no, okay. no, like no. interlude, right? Zach, uh, Jack does a quick advert. We lost Jack. <laughs> Uh, I tell you, this is like a. I can't. This is a really bad build up. I feel like we should have had time for that. There we go. New and improved merch and the back as well. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> but yeah, make sure go go check it out. And it's uh, in case you don't like, happen to not like pink, it's not actually all pink. That's uh, oh, just yeah. Jack's one. <laughs> just mine. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, but that's all from us this week. Uh, see you next week, everyone. Bye. Bye.